welcome to Chit Chat Money. On this show, hosts Ryan Henderson and Brett Schaefer interview industry experts and riff on the world of investing. As a quick reminder, Chit Chat Money is a CCM Media Group podcast. Ryan and Brett are also general partners at Arch Capital, and Arch Capital may have positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Anything discussed on Chit Chat Money by Ryan or Brett or any other podcast guests is not formal advice or recommendation. Now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome into Chit Chat Money. My name is Brett Schaefer, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ryan Henderson. Today is our Tuesday not-so-deep dive episode where we analyze one stock by covering its business model, ownership, financials, future growth opportunities, and much, much more. Today, after listening to the episode, we hope that you'll get a better perspective on a company that you are maybe researching or get inspired to research further. Also, side note, I know a lot of people ask about this when looking at either watching the video or when we share the screen or reference any charts that we're looking at when doing analysis later in the episode. If you want to see those charts and read them maybe after you listen or before you listen, you can subscribe to our free newsletter, which is linked in the show notes wherever you are listening. Okay, today we are covering Boeing, a company that I think every listener has heard of. And if not, you have definitely Well, not definitely, but have likely seen one of their products before. I think this is, yeah, the last, yep, this is the last one in our defense and aerospace month. So if you like any of these type of companies, we covered Rocket Lab last week and then General Dynamics the week before. And next week, we're kind of going to be covering Dropbox, but that's getting ahead of myself. Ryan, let's talk about Boeing. First section, what do they do? And what is, what is their history? Boeing is one of the world's largest aerospace manufacturers, or you'll see the term OEM, original equipment manufacturers for the aerospace industry. Um, basically, they build aircrafts. They also build some other stuff, but the book, their business is building aircrafts. Um, and similar to General Dynamics, which we talked about earlier this month, they're probably known for one thing, which in this case is uh, airplanes, but there is a lot under the umbrella that is not just manufacturing airplanes. So we'll talk about that as well, but they split the business into four parts. So the first one, and this is what most people probably think of when they hear the name Boeing is commercial airplanes. So Uh, abbreviated as BCA. This segment develops and produces a range of different cargo and passenger jet aircrafts, and it's all for commercial customers. And last year, they delivered 480 planes in total, or about 40 planes a month. Back in 2018, they were delivering substantially more planes. We'll talk about the history here in a second. Um, The majority of those planes are 737s, which are generally carry less passengers and there, there's a range of different 737 models um but it's a single aisle configuration it's anywhere from usually 150 to 200 passengers and then the other and that those account for about 81 percent of their deliveries and then the other largest is a 787s that accounts for about six and a half percent this is more of a wide body plane but really the bulk of the commercial business right now is just the 737 model yeah Uh, and but for reference the 787 will have higher revenue per unit but yeah it's still not gonna it's not gonna be that much to outpace the 737 and then the on the other side they and i've attached a visual that they had in their investor deck for anyone that reads the sub stacks or whatever and it just goes through the different models of planes they have just basically just think that they have freighter planes, so cargo planes that they sell to commercial customers as well. But really, the bulk of the commercial airplane segment is the sale of 737s and 787s. There's some other ones in there as well, but I mean, it's, it's mostly that. And then this segment as a whole accounts for 39% of revenue. And then I'm going to reference 2018 probably a couple of times throughout the show because I think that's the year when that's the last year financially where the reporting was sort of at its 
peak, I guess, like operationally, they were at their peak. So I would call that the last normal and putting normal in air quotes year. Um, so in that year, BCA or commercial segment accounted for 65% of operating income. So when this segment is really humming along and kind of at productive, like max productive capacity, it drives the majority of Boeing's business right now. It is losing money. Um, but that's for a plethora of reasons, which I'll get into later. Um, but the second segment here is defense space and security. So this is the defense contractor side of Boeing. They design and produce a number of vehicles and weapons for the US government and some of its allies. This includes fighter jets, helicopters, missile defense systems. I, I attached another visual here, but just basically think um, government aircrafts and different government air vehicles, as well as weapons. The margins are generally a lot thinner. It's kind of like general dynamics, how we talked about the cost plus model, where you're basically, and some of them are fixed price contracts where the margins can vary, but they have a lot of cost plus contracts where the government just pays you the costs of development and then plus a little margin on top. So the margins are thinner, but it's more predictable. That accounts for 35% of revenue and about 13% of operating income in 2018. So at its at kind of its best. Um the last segment, and, and Brett, feel free to pitch in here if you have anything else you want to add. Um Last segment here is just global services. This report, this refers to the aftermarket services that Boeing provides for its customers, both commercial and government. These include things like spare parts, maintenance and modifications, engineering support, pilot training, really anything. I mean, after you buy a plane from Boeing, there's probably uh, a whole lot of different services that you're going to need. After that, beyond you know, it isn't just kind of a one time. All right, we'll take it and do our own thing. Um, you're going to contract out to Boeing and say, "Hey, there's a you know a spare part we need. Can you find this? Can you uh, supply it? Can you help our pilots get up to date? All that kind of stuff." That's a much higher, well, not much, but it's a higher margin offering for Boeing. So, um, in that 2018 year, it accounted for 21 percent of operating income, despite being a much smaller chunk of revenue. Um, and I, I I don't know if I put it down here, but I believe it's mid-teens percentage operating margin as opposed to yeah yeah um, commercial at its best was like twelve percent operating margins. Um, anyway, that, that segment's just a lot more predictable for Boeing and, and more profitable. And then the last one here, and I, I know I'm going a little long, but this is Boeing Capital. They have to break this out just because it's basically its own arm, but. Um, it's tiny. It's 1% of revenue, less than 1% of operating income. Um, it's just helping their customers finance the purchases mostly of Boeing's products. So just giving them, extending them lo loans to acquire it, and then they pay it back over time. Sort of a buy now, pay later of Boeing side. I, it's, I guess. It's a joke, yeah. but <laughs> it's, it's a, yeah. For any, any investor, it doesn't really matter. Exactly. And then I I want to talk. So we live in the area, like the Seattle area, and Boeing's really prominent here. This is a business that we probably either know a lot of engineers at or just know people who work there. And so I do want to give some context on the size of Boeing's physical footprint because I think it helps paint maybe a picture around how difficult this would be for another company to replicate. So Boeing, as of the last 10K, had roughly 87 million square space square feet of floor space, 65 million of that or 75% is owned by Boeing. Um, a lot of companies will will lease the majority. Boeing actually owns the majority of their property. So for reference, that is more than 1,500 football fields uh, to kind of paint that in perspective for anyone that wants to think about it that way. And then it's also more owned space than Amazon. Amazon has a lot more space under its leases, but in terms of true ownership uh, of their space, Boeing has more than Amazon. Other important thing that's important to understand for Boeing is that, and this is really important as of late, it's a very global business. They have not only customers, but suppliers all around the world. They have a lot of suppliers from Asia, uh, a lot of suppliers in China. Which did have some in Russia, not they more. did, yeah. They, uh, what was it, titanium that they were mostly sourcing from there? Um, but I don't know. they, they, uh, 
they've had to relocate a number of their uh, suppliers. There's been a lot of nearshoring, a lot of reshoring that could lead to potentially some increase in cost of goods sold. Um, but I, I guess it's just important to understand that also, it's a little uh, more at risk. Yeah. Also selling products to China. They, I believe, and again, this isn't going to be too important for the episode, but there's two, like, I, I don't think the Chinese are buying Boeing products at the moment, or if they're specifically not buying the 737 MAX, if you're really interested in the stock, I'd probably look at that more closely. And well, actually in their guidance, they say that they're basically getting for no China recovery. And then also the Chinese government are trying to build their own Airbus, which Ryan might be getting into in the history here. Yeah. And I'll say that there have been a lot of governments over the last century that have tried to compete. And it's not just a capital problem trying to build like an actual competitive uh, airplane manufacturer. It's very much like an expertise issue and trying to get up to the same level of quality and, and uh, yeah, or la- well, Maybe up to the last five years, but we'll get into that. And it's, it's similar probably to Taiwan Semiconductor at their peak. Yeah, agreed. Anyway, I'll uh, I'll briefly explain how Boeing was founded, but there are a lot of better resources out there for Boeing's full history. There's so many articles now, documentaries, books written, especially after the recent crashes, um, about kind of the full history. So feel free to just check those out if you want. But I'm going to try to focus more on the last five years. Um, however, just kind of for founding story context, I think some people maybe find this interesting. In 1916, an American timber merchant named William Boeing founded the Pacific Aero Products Company in Seattle, Washington. They got their start as a government contractor. They were building flying boats for the Navy, basically seaplanes, but they called them flying boats uh, in World War One. Over the next, I'd say, three or four decades, they acquired and slowly evolved the business into the kind of commercial manufacturer that they are today. I'm going to fast forward here to 2017 because I think that's when if you're an investor or you're considering investing, that's the history you should probably most be concerned about. So entering 2017, the 737 MAX 8 was a plane that had a lot of buzz for Boeing. It was a single aisle configuration, could seat more than 180 people. They were building out their, they were allocating a lot of their production resources to this model. Um, And their first delivery was May of 2017. They put it in their investor deck, kind of uh, bragged about it, very excited uh, as as they kind of should be. And then, um, and by the fourth quarter of 2018, so I guess that's probably five quarters past their first delivery. They were delivering 40 737 maxes each month. So they really ramped up production quickly on that business. However, as a lot of people probably now know, on October 29th, 2018, Lion Air 737 Max plane crashed in Indonesia. It killed 189 people. There were they they kind of the FAA and, and Boeing both went in and evaluated it and they said, you know, we're going to try to push out a software update in the next six to eight weeks. Um, However, shortly after four months, I think it was about four months after it was March 10th of 28, 2019, sorry. um, Another 737 MAX plane crashed this time killing 157 people. This was Ethiopia Airlines. Um, And three days later, the entire 737 MAX fleet was grounded. Less than a month later, officials said, and at the time, people weren't sure kind of what the impact would be. They said that the MAX could be grounded for as long as two months. Well, it wasn't until 20 months had passed. It was November of 2020 that the FAA officially lifted its grounding orders. So they just kind of slowly, and I I, I was going through the different investor decks from Boeing over those kind of during that time period. And it's like, they're like, okay, we're cutting 20% of 20% 20% of the 737 MAX production. Okay. We're going to do a little more. Okay. We're not producing any 737 MAXs. And it was just this slow grind down um, of that entire fleet, which was a big part of their plans for probably the next five to 10 years. And then in the meantime, COVID hit and completely halted air travel. It 
customer orders halted. Um, and or reversed this, even. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in a lot of cases reversed. And by the third quarter of 2020, Boeing was delivering just 28 commercial planes for the quarter or every three months versus the Q3 two years ago, two years prior to that, they were uh, delivering 190 planes. So basically 80% on the same, reduction. Yeah. On the same fixed cost. Basis, yeah. So the same physical footprint. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there were obviously layoffs associated with COVID as you would expect, but they didn't do, I mean, they still have a massive employee base. I think it's it's grown over the last two years. Um, so yeah, the fixed costs were huge and they're delivering essentially 20% of the planes they once were. This led to them burning $20 billion that year. Um, fortunately, they were able to get some financing, cheap financing at a time when they really, really needed it. I think if this would have happened in any other time period when interest rates weren't where they were, um, th- it maybe would have been catastrophic for the business, but they were able to raise. Um, yeah, I th- I think they would have been able to raise some very, a lot of equity, or excuse, they could have raised a lot of cash from equity offerings, but they might have been very poor deals for outside shareholders as it probably would have been heavily diluted because I could see a lot of banks, a lot of investment banks saying, look, we'll give you an equity offering. And personally, my gripe was that I think the government should have forced them to do this during the pandemic instead of giving them money. Um, They would have done it, but it would have been a really sweet deal for the investment banks or any sort of other financier out there. Yeah. And then I guess two other important points in Boeing's history. And I'm, I'm going to ask you a question associated with this. In 1997, Boeing acquired McDonnell Douglas for $13 billion in stock. And then four years later, Boeing relocated its headquarters to Chicago um, because according to the CEO at the time, it was, and here's a quote, a, lo- a location central to our operating units, customers, and the financial community, but separate from our existing operations. They intentionally separated themselves from their manufacturing side. And there was just this, I think it marked probably a transitioned focus to making shareholders happy. Um, But my question to you is, what do you think was a more pivotal moment for the company's culture? Was it that McDonnell Douglas acquisition? Because apparently that was an integration nightmare. And uh, that was, uh, I, people should watch the Netflix documentary. We'll have a link in the newsletter. I believe if you search Boeing Netflix documentary, it'll pop up. That was, do you remember if that's when they said that like accelerated the quote unquote MBA ification of the executive team was the McDonnell Douglas integration? Yeah. I remember them saying that that basically just marked this huge shift in the culture, but do you think that was a bigger moment or do you think the move to Chicago Kind of pro- uh, I think that probably impacted the Chicago part, but I think Chicago was much more important because they detached themselves literally physically from their important employees, the engineers, the manufacturing team, the quality assurance team, all that stuff. And they talk about it again in the documentary. I remember in Seattle, they basically used to bring this up once every single day in the news when there's union talks about the Chicago headquarters, they go, oh, the executive team in their Chicago headquarters said that, you know, it's it's a whole big thing. Um, but yeah. It is kind of an interesting... I mean, maybe if the next 20 years didn't play out like the the way they did, you wouldn't have thought much of the shift. But now you look back and it's such like a like a point in time you can literally point to and just say, here, here's the shift. Here's when the focus moved to pleasing financial analysts over building high quality planes and not trying to guide for the specific quarter. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll hit industry and competition. I will have more, and I'm sure Ryan will as well, to say on the management team and the specifics once we get to the highlights and lowlights, but we kind of want to give context on how the business works and what their ownership structure and management structure is first. But yeah, let's hit the industry and competition. The commercial aircraft market right now is valued at over $100 billion a year. Boeing projects it to grow at 3.8% annually. I think the number I pulled out might have been only North America and Europe or something like that. 
Uh, but either way, it's a large market opportunity, as and as we'll discuss later, or actually I'll discuss right after this, the competition is just one other company. Uh, they project demand for around 40,000 new planes around the world for the next 20 years. And again, as one of the only manufacturers out there, a lot of this demand can go to them if they can grow their production rate and get back to that 200 a quarter or something like that. Uh, yeah. And then they also think that the cumulative revenue opportunity for them within the commercial aircraft production market is in the trillions of dollars from now until early 2030s. For defense and aerospace, which again, as Ryan mentioned, is a significant part of this business from a revenue perspective, but from an earnings perspective, a little bit less so, but can still drive you know losses um, in cash flow for the company. They are basically selling similar to how we discussed with General Dynamics to the U.S. government and its allies. I, if you listen to that episode, go back and listen to that. Or excuse me, if you haven't listened to that episode, go back and listen to it. And there's a lot more details on how that industry works. I would reference the chart for the market opportunity as basically showing that the U.S. government spends around $850 billion or more per year on the Department of Defense. So there's a huge market opportunity there. Uh, if we look at the competition in aviation in the 10K, Boeing says things all the time, and Ryan can attest to this as well, that the aviation field is highly competitive, but they only name one competitor, and that is Airbus, which is the European champion. They also mentioned China a few times, who is trying to build, like I mentioned before, and subsidize its own state-run aircraft manufacturer, but they haven't had much success here. The question I want to ask is, and I think some people know this, but maybe other investors that are just getting interested in this company will be, uh, I don't know, want to know, why does this industry have such high barriers to entry? Well, I mean, there's an, I think there's a number of reasons. Probably the first one is it's expensive to build. It's expensive to build a plane. It's very expensive to build a lot of planes at the same time. Um, not only do you have to like, you know, afford the equipment, you also have to afford the labor. You have to buy the talent. I mean, so, so in some cases, there's single departments or people at Boeing where it's really diff difficult to replicate that expertise that they've developed over 20 years. Um, and it, it's not something, it, there are examples where China, I believe has tried to re-engineer existing planes from Boeing and they can't. It's, I mean, there's like, I guess I don't know the specific reason why it's impossible to do this, but it's just a number of the, I mean, the scale, the size, the labor, the expertise. Support it, staffs at all the different airports and wherever you're working on planes as an airline. Customer Supported. relationships. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, I think there's a number of reasons it's difficult to replicate. Yeah. It's got a extremely high boat, which was definitely a bet. It's a huge benefit for the company, but was also probably part of its lacks, you know, how it kind of lost track of itself over the last 20 years. We look at, uh, the competition in defense and aerospace, uh, or basically just defense and space, there are many companies. There's Lockheed Martin, there's Raytheon, SpaceX, even Rocket Lab, which we discussed last episode, as a startup in the space industry. They actually have a partnership with Lockheed Martin in spaceflight called the United Launch Alliance. Uh, it's only mentioned four times in the annual report. They've staked the uh, Boeing stake is valued at $587 million on its balance sheet, so not too relevant, but something I may need to track or keep an eye on, see if there's any development there. But this industry is much more competitive. It's not a hyper-competitive industry. There's only you know a handful of companies and then some startups that are trying to get funding to, to inch their way into the market, but it is much more competitive than the aviation market, which just has two companies. All right, let's move on to management and ownership. I think this is important here for this company. The CEO of Boeing today is David Calhoun. He was appointed in early 2020 after those 737 MAX disasters and the poor execution from the prior executive teams. As a highly technical company, I think it is important to look at the biography of Boeing CEO and their technical expertise or lack thereof. Calhoun graduated from Virginia Tech with a degree in accounting. He then worked at GE for 26 years, then Nielsen Holdings, then Blackstone. So he's not a... 
uh, STEM executive or a STEM person, which by that, for anyone that knows, science, technology, engineering, me- medicine, I think, medicine, whatever. I think it's medicine, but either way, he's not an engineering or manufacturing CEO. He's very much an MBA executive, if you want to put it that way. I find this to be a big negative when evaluating Boeing as a potential investment. I also didn't like, and it may be, look, they moved their headquarters from Chicago to Virginia just recently. And I think that makes sense because you're close to the government, right? I think that's important for a company like this. But also, I didn't like that this guy is from Virginia Tech and he just wanted to be close to his college. I found that to be a bit, uh, not like a huge deal, but I was like, why, why Virginia? Why Virginia Tech? Why are we moving close to, to this campus, huh? What do you think, Ryan? Is it a big negative for you that this guy is just a GE accounting guy and then a, a Blackstone guy? I'm, yeah, I'm probably more wary of the, the, him being the whole Jack Welch disciple, kind of a GE guy, um, as opposed to the headquarters relocation. I'd be surprised if it had that much to do with him going to college in the area. Um, it's a coincidence, though. <clears throat> I got to say, that's a coincidence. It is. I listened to an interview with him, and I think there's a whole bunch of people that came out of GE that are like the blueprint for what you don't want as a CEO. And I'm sorry, and Jack Welch did a good job there, but I think he also deferred a lot of problems. And you really can't have that at a business like this. It, I, I think you're right. I think you need an engineer at the helm. I think you need to stay in touch with the manufacturing side of the business as much as you can. Um, and live and being in Virginia or being in Chicago when the bulk of your business is in South Carolina or, or and Seattle. Yeah. Seattle. I don't know. Yeah. I don't really like that. And then you're about to get to the proxy, but I really didn't like that either. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that now. So, like, uh, I don't think we need to talk about the board of directors pay, as people might expect. Uh, they get paid highly, uh, but it's not going to matter for a company that's such a big one like Boeing. If you look at executive compensation, and say it with me, everyone that's listened to all our shows, they have base salaries, annual bonuses, and long-term equity awards. And you can guess it, they use a compensation consultant that we have found employs the same, uh, they, they give the same strategy to every company. Um, I'd also like to look at this quote because I think what's interesting about Boeing is, yeah, they've had some hiccups. One was definitely self-induced, the 737 MAX disaster. One could be a bit of an excuse to the COVID-19 pandemic. So their earnings and financials and all their hurdles that they're supposed to hit have been low for their annual bonuses and their equity awards. But here's a quote from their annual report, or excuse me, the proxy statement. Quote, as was the case in prior years, and to better reflect the core operating performance of the company, the compensation committee retained discretion to adjust the results under one or more of these metrics to account for blah, 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 blah. It keeps going. What this means is that they lowered the hurdles for getting their bonuses because the results were worse. And they're blaming the macroeconomic you know, environment, maybe that that's true. The macroeconomic environment was poor, but I don't think that means you should be getting bonuses, um, you know, calling it crazy. The annual bonuses are a bit complicated, but generally they go down to earnings power, free cash flow stuff, not a huge concern there. Combined, the company um, hit its free cash flow targets last year in 2022, missed its earnings targets, but they still got over 100% of the annual payouts. One question I have here is, when they focus on free cash flow, and maybe we'll talk about this when we get to the balance sheet, are they rewarding themselves for depleting inventory? Because they, their inventory has grown a bit uh, over the last few years. Yeah, it isn't down that much in 2022, but there were some other, let's call it tricks, um, yeah. build up of accrued liabilities uh funding 401k contributions with treasury stock right to, yeah, yeah good point um to boost cash flow so yeah it's slightly concerning it just makes me kind of sick to my stomach to just picture this boardroom when they're like all right here were our goals for the year and they're like we didn't meet any of them 
All right. Well, is it next year? Let's lower. reduce them. <laughs> Let's reduce them. And yeah. uh, good job, team. Great year. Or why don't we actually make adjustments for all our costs that were real costs um, yeah. and just pretend they didn't exist? Yeah. And then for anyone that's going to read the newsletter, I'm going to put in backlog and inventory as a long term chart because I think that's important. Their inventory has risen since before the pandemic and before the 737 MAX disasters. Uh, the only other thing I have in management and ownership as we try to move along here is that total executive compensation was $59 million, over five named executive officers in 2022. Although they did change one out, so they technically had six people on that list, but they have five named executive officers. They have minimal insider ownership. They have large employee ownership via this Newport Trust Company. It's a little bit confusing, but that's what I believe it was. I did a little bit of research into that. So the employees own 7.4% of this company. I think that's probably a good thing over the long term. The union can be, hey, look, we want the stock to do well. We, we you know, we want to keep management aligned. And they've tried to do that, I think, but have been unsuccessful until the 737 Max disaster uh, hit a boiling point. Here's the question I want to talk about before we move on to financials. Is it possible for the cultural problems at Boeing to get fixed? Ryan, I know it's a giant question, but well, what are your thoughts? Do you lean yes or do you lean no? God, that's tough. Um, I think it's possible. I don't think Dave Calhoun is the guy. I, agree. I think having yeah. some, and maybe I'm wrong about him. Maybe it, it's just kind of his resume that gives me an icky vibe. Um, I think I, I was not a fan of, I read that book. Um, I forget what it's called, but the the one about how GE kind of fell apart. Oh and, yeah, I mean, and he's probably part of that, right? Had to have been. Yeah, I think there. he left when he wasn't chosen to be Welch's successor. Um, I could be getting some of this wrong, so I I don't want to talk too much about it. But it just it feels like the guy who looks like he's great for the job, but can really masquerade issues under that are going on. I, I think you do need. An engineer at the helm. I th think you need someone who's like maniacally focused on production and the production side of things. And yeah. I, I'm just not sure Calhoun's that guy. Yeah. All right. We'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Yeah. Because we, we think it, I think it's probably the most important part of this episode and this company. But let's move on to earnings, Ryan. This is a tough one. There's a lot of numbers, a lot of moving parts. So, what are the important things for any investor to know about when, you know, at this, they're coming out of the crossroads, but it's a weird time for the company financially. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And adjustments galore on this one. Oh, um, yeah. Sp speaking of GE, hey, right? Yeah. I guess do what you got to do to get that bonus. But $67 billion in revenue for 2022. That's up 7% year over year. Production improved, but they are still at a fraction of the size they were in 2018 in terms of how many units they're moving. Uh, this year, they generated $3.5 billion in operating losses. That's minus 5% operating margins. All of this is an improvement over the last kind of two years, but still significantly reduced relative to what they once were. And obviously, they have to get to profitability if, if this investment is going to work. Um, Negative $5 billion in earnings before taxes. This is important because we're going to talk about the balance sheet in here in a second. They took on a lot of debt during the crisis and the operating income does not encapsulate the interest expense, which is big for them. It, it's a it's a big chunk. You can see there the discrepancy is a billion and a half dollars between operating income and earnings before taxes. So uh, it, important to kind of look at either I would use probably the earnings before taxes figure because they are probably going to have some uh, tax offsets thanks to all the losses they've had over the last couple of years. So I think that's probably a good figure to, figure to use. However, as we talked about, there's a big discrepancy between gap earnings and operating cash flow. So they had positive $3.5 billion in operating cash flow. However, as I kind of looked through it, my initial thought was, okay, they had a big buildup of inventory. They weren't delivering any 737 maxes. So there was probably, they were probably sitting in different hangars waiting to get delivered. But inventories really didn't come down a whole lot. Instead, one of the biggest differences is depreciation and amortization, right? They aren't, uh, that's, 
That's a gap figure, but it's not accounted for in the cash flow statement. They have $78 billion in aircrafts sitting on their books. So naturally, I mean, there's yeah, going to be huge. yeah. There's going to be some depreciation, obviously, there. Um, Stock-based compensation was a fairly big one, but the other one was they... I want to make sure I get their ex- explanation for it. They said they issued $1.2 billion worth of treasury shares to fund the company's portion of 401k contributions. So essentially SBC, yeah. Yeah, I kind of think about that as SBC. Now, I do think maybe that's the right move. And keep in mind, they do like, I think they have a 401k match program probably. So there, you know, it is a positive, I guess, for employees. Um, but and doing it in stock at a time when the company needs the cash, maybe that makes sense. But when you're compensated on certain free cash flow targets and you hit it because of this, it kind of just, I don't know, it makes me think that maybe it wasn't all well intentioned, I suppose. Um other one here is the buildup of accrued liabilities. They they recognize there's something called forward loss recognition, which is accounted for in their gap statements. Uh, it's basically just losses that they haven't booked. Um, so that was a buildup as well. Basically, cash flow is positive because they've done a decent job managing their balance sheet, which is good. Right now, they need the cash, but that is not shareholder earnings. You shouldn't look at that as a proxy for cash that's available to you as shareholders. Um, I guess for this year, they're projecting three to five billion dollars in free cash flow. They want to hit ten billion dollars in free cash flow by twenty twenty six, maybe twenty twenty five. They said either or, but they're probably going to knowing them twenty twenty six. Yeah, and then the total backlog is four hundred eleven billion dollars. I mean, the backlog's strong. Uh, demand i mean travel demand is still quite strong which means airlines are they want more planes they're um, signing a lot of contracts they're, the press releases the, that's like the biggest highlight right now ryanair huge contract uh saudi arabia airlines turkish airlines lufthansa a lot and i mean well they're the only place that people can go outside of airbus so yeah i mean it, the demand is there it's a matter of getting productive capacity uh we should talk about they did up and gone. Yeah, they stopped something. They found a problem with the 737, a very small one that they addressed. Fuselage. Yeah, something um, that wasn't like a safety concern, apparently. Although I, I don't know how much I want to trust them now because they are a bit of a boy who cried wolf. But they said that's going to be a hiccup in production for the next few months. So definitely track that because they've gone from saying things are going to be a hiccup in production for a few months to two years. and. Yeah, it seems like the problem they said it was solved, but uh, it also watch. Keep watching. Yeah, they did not have to, and they made sure to clarify they did not have to retrofit the planes they had already delivered. It was planes that they were building out currently. But yeah, they've said before, you know, the seven three seven max could be grounded for two months, and it was grounded for twenty. So I mean, that wasn't really up to them as much, but it seems like the production problems keep surfacing which is i mean that's gonna that's gonna determine what their profitability levels are as for the balance sheet and liquidity um they've got 15 billion dollars in cash and short-term investments as for inventories they've got about 78 billion dollars in inventories on the balance sheet that didn't come down much year over year however relative to 2018 they were operating with about 63 billion dollars in inventory so it is elevated. I imagine there some of that might just be price increases over time, but uh, and I don't think they gave a figure on how many planes or like units they're they're holding, like what that equates to. But um, just just something to keep track of because it it leads to a typically a big difference between the cash flow and the uh, gap earnings liabilities. Though this was this is probably based on current numbers the most heavily indebted business we've looked at on the show, they have $55 billion in total debt, 8 billion of that is short term. However, pretty much half of that debt is due in 2059 and 2060. So, and that accrues interest at a fixed rate between 4% and 6.6%. Who signed that deal? The other side of it. Good deal for Boeing, I think. Yeah. I, I mean, good on them. And I think it's a testament to probably the durability of the business, but 
over the last 12 months, they've only generated $2.6 billion in EBITDA. So if they're going to continue to have production problems and that's their, call it normalized EBITDA, and if it is, this stock's going to come down a lot. But that would imply a net debt to EBITDA ratio of 15 times. However, if you believe that they can recover back to the 2018 levels of profitability, they were doing like $12 billion in operating income that year. That'd be three times net debt to EBITDA. It becomes much more manageable. The interest expense wouldn't be too crazy, um, given that it's fixed rate. And I guess the bummer is that they have a lot of cash needs right now. So it's not like they're earning. It's not like they've taken that debt and put it into treasuries and they're earning more than they pay out in interest expense. They have to use that cash and they can't really earn as much on the on the cash balances right now. So um the, the the balance sheet is tricky. Obviously, if they're if they run into problems again, this is going to be a huge issue. They, they've got to pay down that debt over time. Uh, but be, I guess my overall thoughts here are the fact that they were able to borrow forty years into their future at a fixed four to five percent interest rate, probably weighted average. It's a testament to their moat. If a storm of bad news hits them like it did in the last five years. They're going to be in much bigger trouble, and they're going to theorize. What are they going to borrow out to twenty eighty? It. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the government won't let it fail, but we'll see what happens to the equity if that happens. It's yeah, and also I'll talk about this later too. They have less optionality for R and D, new product development, all that stuff with this balance sheet than they would have had historically. All right, I think that's it for balance sheet. Let me move to valuation quick. EV right now is about one hundred sixty-one billion dollars. If we add back that net debt, if for earnings or earning any earnings multiples, it's tough because they're not. You know, the trailing numbers are going to make it look very inflated, but they should have an inflection over the next few years. I just wanted to look at what their EV to free cash flow would be if they hit five billion dollars. Which is one of their stated goals in, in, in trailing free cash flow. And then if they hit $10 billion, which is their 2025, 2026 goal, if they hit that $5 billion goal, their EV to free cash flow at current levels is about 32. So quite elevated. If they hit that $10 billion goal, uh, it is 16.2. So it seems to me like the market is saying that they believe the $10 billion goal is achievable. And if you want to invest in this company, you got to think that they're going to do more. Um, is that a good way to put it, Ryan? You think? Yeah, I mean, you have to believe that that ten billion dollar figure is accurate, and it's going up from Higher. there. Yeah, yeah, significantly, most likely. Um, I'm all right, surprised. Anecdote, or go ahead. I- I'm surprised this stock isn't cheaper. Yeah, well, it's a bull. Uh, this is one that a lot of people own. A lot of indexes own. There's a lot of people that I think own this that don't. You know what I mean? There's no insider ownership. A lot of passive There's, ownership. Yeah, a lot of passive ownership, a lot of dividend funds. Yeah, but I agree with you. All right, anecdotal evidence. What do you think, Brian? Well, yeah, you know, I saw what you had written down here, and I think that's accurate. At least, you know, we grew up in the area where Boeing, I think, at one point in Seattle, they were like an employer of like one in one in. Five, five yeah. or one in six and six people. Was, yeah, I think that was in 1970, but still, that's huge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's a huge corporation here. Um, and I think they've always had a pretty solid reputation, at least for engineers. Of Big, big connection to the big engineering universities, yeah. Yeah, just taking care of their employees. I, I know a lot of people that have been four lifers there, basically. Um, a lot of kind of tenure mentality and just like staying there for a long time. Uh, they have a lot of good benefits, take care of their employees. A lot of good engineers want to be there. So I, I don't know. I, I think it's still relevant if you're an engineer in today's world. My concern kind of is that, especially growing up around here, there it's almost like this idea that they can't fail. That like it's so important to the government, it's so important to air travel globally that it's kind of just going to be around for a while. I wonder if that's what it felt like at and very different situation. The big investment banks, the, it always feels like that before, like before the great financial crisis. You know, once you're like a part of it, you think there's no way this could go down. 
you probably have ownership in the business. You see all these really smart engineers around you. You kind of believe that it's better position than maybe it really is. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, the angle of evidence I have is I do, and again, I was in an, a mechanical engineering program, so I do have boots on the ground here. Good engineers still want to work at Boeing. They dominate the university market. People talk about all the time. Did you get a Boeing internship? Blah, 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 blah. It's very hard to get. It's still very prestigious for someone to get that um, and work there as an engineer, at least in some of the areas. I think the problems likely start and begin with the fact that it, with the executives, they have become detached by distance and philosophy from the boots on the ground, designing and building the airplanes. I don't like, like we mentioned before, how they moved the headquarters to Virginia, although maybe that's a better location than Chicago, which seemed like the absolute worst location because either you want to be, if you're an aviation company, you either want to be near Washington, D.C., which they are now, or on the West Coast, which is the center of aviation. They were neither beforehand. They were kind of like the complete, you know, Let's make it the worst possible city to, to choose. But that's besides the point. We don't have to hit uh, much on that. Let's move into future growth opportunities. Ryan, what do you think here? Uh, you have increased production, which I guess is simple, but the most important thing. Yeah, I was honestly thinking of this one for a while, like what to say here. And the only way that they get back to like a stable business that can invest in other branches, start to invest in invest more in the space initiatives and other projects and maybe uh, new models, things like that, is to get back to better productive uh, capacity and, and stable earnings so that you're not worried about that. The only way to do that is to increase production. But I wonder if it's not like it's not like these people aren't doing anything. It's not like there's just a whole bunch of unused space where they're like, oh, we just got to like hire more people and stuff like that. I I wonder how difficult of a problem it is to really ramp that back up. I imagine there's a lot more, I don't want to say red tape because it sounds like it shouldn't be there. I imagine there's a lot more procedures, safety I'd procedures hope. involved after the the crashes. Um, but that's probably a good thing, but they did, yeah. they must have had, like they've had a lot of technical tech do the, the executive stuff, which we've harped on and which everyone kind of knows about at this point. Uh, due to the, the changing culture that really ruined their whatever leadership in engineering. But the question is, can they get back to that? I don't know. Yeah, I just wonder if like some post-grad finance person threw eight, in their 2026 guidance said, we're going to get back to 800 deliveries just to please the financial community. And then they went and brought this to some manufacturing lead and was like, we need to get to this figure. Can, can we do that? Yeah. Instead of like, saying, absolutely yeah. not, you know? Yeah. Or they instead, yeah, they would, I, I wonder if they said that or they went to the manufacturers first, which they should do and say, look, how many planes can you get out the door that aren't, you know, are going to be high quality and then going with that number. Um, I think they need to take a field trip to Asia and go check out Taiwan Semiconductor and Toyota and just say, Hey, look, yeah, right. Like let's learn from you guys. They need to really, They've lost their touch, but I'll uh, I'll take one that's maybe a bit more exciting, and this is the one that's only going to be possible if they get back to generating profits from the aviation division. So they need to increase production, like Brian mentioned. That is the key thing that needs to happen. And I have fully embracing space flight as their next avenue for growth. I would look at that United Launch Alliance. Um, it doesn't seem to me that they're taking that seriously as a company. I'm sure the people working there are incredibly smart and doing good work. But as a company, this seems to be one of their lower priorities when space flight seems to be the future of the industry. Um, it's only mentioned four times in the annual report and really only in passing to mention why their investment portfolio was written down. If I am a shareholder in Boeing or a prospective shareholder, which I guess we all are, I want the company to stop talking about free cash flow, which they seem to mention 20 times in their investor presentation, and talk about investing in you know cutting-edge aerospace, Space flight technology, taking that operating cash earnings or whatever it is that the gross profit that they generate from these production lines and invest in cutting edge aerospace, space flight technology to compete with SpaceX, Rocket Lab, all these other competitors. They have clearly built up technical debt over the last 20 years, like we talked about. I think it would be a very big positive indicator for me if they said something along the lines of, you know, we're not going to lose money. We're not going to go deep into the red here, but we're going to take a lot of our cash flow. 
and you know double our research into these future end markets. Because again, I'll mention in my lowlights, we haven't heard a peep about a new product from the aviation line. And it seems like that's something that needs to happen because, and maybe they just haven't announced yet, but these things take 10 to 15 years to get to market. Yeah, I'd still... I don't think it's surprising that that's probably an afterthought now relative to getting aviation production back up and running. Yeah, but I think like when they talk about their 2025, 2026 goals and they say we're going to generate $10 billion in free cash flow, I, I just don't like that because that's showing that they're going to take the old products. And again, the 787 is the best out there, right? But it is going to age eventually. They got to get some of these stuff out there to market. And maybe these updated products will be fine. But yeah. I, I still see that as they got to keep the R and D um, aggressive, and I don't think they're doing enough. All right, Ryan, let's move the highlights and lowlights as we kind of close things out here. What did you like, dislike about looking at Boeing? Yeah, we, we've talked a lot about the advantages already, but it's clearly a difficult business to replicate. Governments have not been able to do it, and that is without you know, that's with kind of unlimited funds. They've done it once. Yeah, you know, did it with Airbus. But it took multiple governments to do it. Yeah, that was kind of a consortium of, I guess it was really just Germany and France, wasn't it? Yeah, I can't remember. I believe England was in and maybe backed out, but mainly France and Germany, yeah. But the, yeah, and I I guess, you know, Boeing's a a government contractor, so maybe they've had more government uh, help than they they give themselves credit for um but i mean they've they've obviously built out the commercial side as well i don't know it's it's impossible to replicate no one's going to build this in the u.s at boeing scale i mean am i wrong there's no way someone can do that right i would say never say never but extremely low likelihood right it's kind of like another tsmc in taiwan like that's not going to happen right yeah uh, other parts other highlights i guess and market growth historically air traffic has grown at about two times gdp it's a little bit lumpy but this should serve as a lasting tailwind for demand for boeing's products last one is this is not a business the government wants to let die that does not mean shareholder returns are going to be good but i could see the some situation where they just pay off debt indefinitely and they continue to get kind of easy financing because they want the business to keep running but there's the free cash flow per share never yeah it could give you a margin of safety somewhat but maybe maybe not from these prices maybe from those more discounted prices uh, a few years ago yeah and then low lights for me i guess if they have another crash or any other scenario god forbid uh that mirrors what they saw in 2018 2019 the debt load is going to be extremely difficult to service they're going to run pretty low on cash Uh, they just can't have that happen again and rates are higher today so you kind of have to have sort of an ideal next decade like i don't want to say flawless but you can't have another crash like that where it's something Boeing caused and and expect good shareholder returns. That's just kind of one of the risks you take by owning the shares in Boeing. Uh, the other part is the proxy adjustments disgust me. I Yeah, not great. It's, Especially when they've killed people because, uh, not indirectly, indirectly killed people, I should say. Uh, talk to our lawyers that we don't have. But the, uh, you know, Right, they were paying these fat bonuses. Didn't they pay themselves fat bonuses in 2019? I believe Mullen, Mullen had a ridiculous severance payout. That was the guy that got fired. Who was the problem? Yeah, the CEO. Well, there was a bunch of people that got fired. But do you really need this guy's clearly got a lot of money? Fifty nine million dollars this year as executives, really? You've, when you're when you're Dave, you have negative earnings, yeah. Dave Calhoun, I'm sure is doing just fine it just feels like out of touch with what really matters 
a hundred percent, a hundred percent. All right. My highlights. I mean, there's a lot to be honest, we've been harping on like the problems here. And I think it's because at its core, there's so much to like about this business. One, there are huge barriers to entry, like we talked about and minimal competition, which I think is probably due to the huge barriers to entry. I mean, it's fantastic. And the end market is growing in aviation. So you have a duopoly and growing end market. If this company, company gets humming, I mean, they're going to, it's it's like guaranteed earnings, honestly. And maybe that that was their issue. They were resting on their laurels. Low lights, though. I have a few unpredictable cash flow. We talked about that. You know, the the, the balance sheet stuff. Look at that. Look at the cash flow. Look at the cash flow management. Um, you can have inventory buildups. You could have you know cyclicality with customer demand stuff like that. Second low light. They haven't shown signs of ramping up R and D for a new product since the seven eighty seven. And I guess I wrote this kind of twice, but like their R and D spend looks solid as a percentage of revenue. It stayed stable over time. It ramped up during the 787 build out, but I wish they would kind of trend that R and D as a percentage of revenue higher, given the nature of the two industries they operate in, which are you need a technological lead to continue. And I think really the big low light for me is dropping the ball over the last 20 years in general on product development. You know, the 787 turned out to be a great product, but for anyone that lives in the Pacific Northwest, every day they would talk about how the 787 was way behind schedule when it was coming out. And this is the only big product they've released in the last 20 years. Yes, they've had the updates for the existing products, but again, it's not going to be, you know, I don't know. Like, and maybe those are took a lot of R&D, but... Uh, I just, I just don't like, uh, here's the question I have. How was it possible that they were crushed by a startup like SpaceX in space flight? It might not be hyperbole to say that they were the premier engineering institution outside of government agencies and labs in the world for the second half of the 20th century. And then they just lost to these startups in space flight, which they should have had an easy market to go into because they were the leader in, you know, commercial aviation. They should have been able to move into space flight, I think. Or they were the ones set up the best to move into space flight, maybe locked them up as well. I really think that in order to retain their form, former glory, they need to drastically up their R and D spend, um, which isn't happening. Right now. And then the last one we talked about already: don't trust the, the management. Okay, bull case, Ryan. You ran through some of the numbers. What do you got for the listeners? Yeah, hardly. I. It's more just the, the guidance they issued, which. It doesn't like ten billion dollars. This isn't some well thought out guidance. It's just an objective, so take it as such. If it was well thought out, it wouldn't be ten billion dollars on the dot. Yeah, and like we mentioned, this is not a good company to have a cash flow guidance that you target because of the you know the need for quality assurance, the need for R and D, like we talked about like time and time again. Right. Wouldn't you say like, you can't have that number where, oh no, we're going to cut costs to hit that number. Well, that's how the 737 backs up. Yeah. Um, so at their investor conference, they stated that their objectives are 800 annual commercial aircraft deliveries by 2026. They want mid single digit growth for their services business and low single digit growth for their defense business. These together would get Boeing to hundred, $100 billion in revenue, a figure they've been at in the past. Um, and they are striving to reach 10% operating margin. So $10 billion in annual operating income. Between 2010 and 2019, which was a great decade for them, they traded at an average EV to EBIT multiple of 13 times. It was more like 15 to 20 times when kind of in their in their later years, right up to 2019. So let's assume it does trade back to 20 times, that would be a $200 billion market cap on theoretical operating income figures. Today, the enterprise value is $160 billion. And keep in mind, operating income does not include the interest expense, which they'll have to pay. Yeah. Um, I think you really have to assume they're going to grow without a hiccup over the next five years, get production back to 800 commercial aircrafts a year. And they get valued at 20 times for this to even be like a discussion 
of whether or not it's a high performing investment because 160 billion dollar EV I didn't do the math but 160 to 200 over 4 years we're kind of making some big leaps to make that happen or big assumptions there that, will that be wouldn't some be cash. great returns there will be some cash you could add on there but that just helps it a little bit yeah uh, i don't know the bull case i think a lot has to go right and that 10 billion dollar figure has to be has to look small in a, two decades yeah or seven or, years yeah i don't know yeah. I, 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 what well, i guess yeah why don't you hit your bull case first yeah i mean i think if they hit 10 billion dollars in free cash flow a year and that's consistent the stock will be fine but it's not gonna be a home run um the question is what's the quality of that free cash flow which we talked about with the balance sheet changes is it just an inventory drop is it just sbc is it just working capital right um seems like they're trying to hit those numbers by not actually generating earnings which continue to be negative uh bear case ryan what do you think it seems like we have the same ones which is the stuff that happened over the last five years continues to happen yeah that's i mean that is the big one if they have continued difficulty expanding production or worse they try so hard to meet their production goals that i mean the executives push so hard for the manufacturing to churn out 800 a year that there's a slip up in the process that there aren't the checks needed and it leads to a 2018 2019 like mistake or not even maybe a deathly one it just leads to one where that pauses production yeah i mean that i don't know the downside seems huge here i don't think they'll ever die because the government probably won't let them but i think shareholder returns could be abysmal over the next decade it's certainly possible especially if anything goes wrong yeah i have the same bear case i think the question investors should ask here is if these product and quality issues happen for the last five years why should we expect anything different to happen for the next five they are really in prove it mode in my book and i don't know why they're trading at this theoretical 20 times earnings so it's kind of crazy what the stock yeah. trades at. maybe, maybe yeah. we're outlining a short here i don't uh, we don't short so if given it, honestly if you're a short seller or someone that shorts and listens to this honestly i'd say look into this further i i would not uh, nothing we do here is a recommendation but this seems like a very overvalued in my book given where they're at and given that they are in prove it mode i i would think for the entire investment community i mean they got a they got to get to that 10 billion dollar figure that's that's theoretical yeah the how, it should the trade quality? it like it should trade at a discount not a premium to theoretical cash flow yeah well you're preaching to the choir ryan all right more or less interested let's close things out ryan what are your final thoughts on this business it's a no for me i'm less interested i think it is one of the highest barriers to entry but so many things can go wrong management is not my favorite that the and maybe it's more just indicative of the culture overall but i thought the proxy adjustments were like the cherry on top for me to just say like you guys are out of touch with what this business should be focusing on yeah i agree i am not interested i don't trust management at the right price and with the right management team focused on the right things i think this is a great buy it's an easy buy because the moat is so strong but it's not there today so i it's one that you don't even need to put on your watch list because you know it's always there but if you know something changes over the next decade in stock it's the let's say this current management team doesn't do well like we're outlining they bring in some real engineers to lead them or manufacturing people and they say look we're going to fix this thing maybe, maybe there's an opportunity there but at this price with this management team no way am I touching this thing. All right, that's going to close out this episode. Next week, we have our monthly recurring Arch Capital episode, and we are going to go through not as exciting as the company as last time or the time before, which is Nintendo and Match Group, and it is the software company Dropbox. However, we think it's polarizing a, stock. It is a polarizing stock, so I think it'll be interesting to go through our bull case and try to refute some of the bear cases, which 
we will admit probably during the episode could have some validity. So it'll be a fun one to go through. We're very excited about that one. All right. For anyone that's listening, remember, if you didn't li- hear before and you want access to the show notes and the charts, subscribe to the newsletter. The link is right in the show notes below where you're listening on your device right now. Give us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts to support the show. That's the best way to do it. We are not financial advisors. Anything we say on the show is not formal advice or recommendation. We are general partners at Arch Capital. The clients may have securities discussed in this podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you next time.